Um, in honor of the German publication of No Grain, No Pain, I really want to talk about pain and inflammation. And so uh, it, on that note, I'm going to give you some very, very specific strategies that are oftentimes missed or not talked about. So if you're struggling with any type of chronic pain or chronic inflammation, you want to take heed and pay attention. So strategy number one is movement. Um, this is one of those, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything other than your time. Um, but um, if, if when I say movement, basically I'm referring to exercise, uh, movement and exercise, because understand that your joints themselves don't have a blood supply. They are actually nourished by the synovial fluid, which is the fluid that surrounds your cartilage or base your cartilage. So your cartilage in order to get nourishment. So if you're struggling with like chronic knee pain, chronic shoulder pain, joint pain, wrist pain, elbow pain, et cetera, neck pain, and you find yourself in a sedentary type of work environment where you're sitting for you know six plus hours a day in a fixed position, staring at a screen, not doing a whole lot, not having a lot of walking, not having a lot of movement. One of the first things that you should incorporate immediately is more movement. Now, some of you might be saying, you know, I can't really move because it hurts too bad, right? So you get stuck in that vicious cycle of, uh, the chronic pain and inflammation creates the inability to move and you still have to move. You've still got to find a way to move. So I'm not necessarily talking about going and joining a CrossFit gym here. I'm talking about gentle movement. So if it's your neck, we want side to side motion. We want rotation. We want back to forth, back and forth motion. We want um, light stretching. We want basically lubrication of the cartilage. And the only way that you're going to do that is through movement. So whatever the joint is, it's just a really good idea to get up and get moving. Now, I know that sounds kind of like, duh, no brainer. Uh, everybody knows that. Yeah, it's true. Everybody does know that, but not everybody does it. And, and a lot of people say, yeah, I know it, but they continue to ignore it. Even though they know it, they don't give it the credence or the credibility that it deserves. And they don't give it the time of day that it deserves. So they never get to experience the impact that movement can have on pain and inflammation. Remember that movement, not only does it stimulate the vitamins and the minerals and the fluids around your joints to nourish your joints, but the movement actually sir helps circulate cerebrospinal fluid around your brain. So it helps nourish your brain. So those of you who are in pain and also suffering with, you know, memory recall problems, if you're suffering with brain fog, you know, this is something that you want, you need to consider. And in addition, movement actually increases and improves detoxification by increasing lymphatic flow. So if you're not moving, your body's not detoxing. And if it's not detoxing, it's accumulating toxins and you're retoxing. And so if you're doing, you know, like a juice detox or if you're taking a supplement for detoxification and you're finding that you continue to struggle because you live a sedentary life, remember that taking supplements to detoxify without movement means you're just going to retox. You're not going to get those things pushed out of your body without adequate movement because a big way they get out of you is through lymphatic flow. So it's very, very important that you have movement in your life. Now, one of my favorite forms of movement is um, whole body vibration. So if you're, if you're injured, um, if you're injured and you don't have, um, and you don't have the capacity to like go out and walk because you're that injured, you can always get on a vibration plate. Um, and if you go to glutenfreesociety.org shop, there's a, there's a link there that, that, uh, that you can check out where there's some very affordable home-based vibration plates, but they work fantastically well because they generate a, uh, uh, an oscillation of vibration frequency into your joints, muscles, and bones. So basically they help your body internally and your water move internally. And, uh, and so it's a great way to get movement without high pressure on your joints. In other words, without the, without the, the chronic pounding, it's a great way to get that movement. Another great way to get that movement is through swimming. So again, if you're in chronic pain, getting in the swimming pool can be very, very effective uh, early on to start getting that extra movement and start rebuilding some muscle. So movement, one of the, again, one of the least applied concepts for many people that struggle with chronic pain. As a matter of fact, as a chiropractor, and I don't do much chiropractic anymore. I, I'm primarily a functional medicine. But when I used to run a rehab clinic, this was, you know, over a decade ago, um, the vast majority of these people that I would see with chronic back pain, chronic knee pain, chronic shoulder pain, what would happen was once I put them through movement protocols, 90% of them would have pain reduction. So again, it's, it's one of those things, a lot of doctors want to jump to pain medication. They want to jump to non inflammatories. They want to jump to surgeries, but nobody jumps to movement. Nobody dives into that movement piece. So you've got to get the movement going. Do not underemphasize how important movement is to deal with chronic pain and inflammation. Uh, we got Sylvia all the way from Barcelona, Spain. Thanks for joining us today, Sylvia. 
Uh, looks like uh, Tasha's joining in. She says, uh, this is what I tell my husband. He says, oh, it hurts, but you still need to do it. Absolutely, Tasha. Get him up. Get him moving. Okay. Strategy number two, inflammatory, uh, or rather I should say anti-inflammatory. I'm going to type this in for you. Anti-inflammatory foods. So, any inflammatory foods are very, very important. Now, some could argue that um, all foods are in anti-inflammatory, and some could argue that all foods are inflammatory. Let me let me kind of explain. Uh, let's let's talk in generalities here. Anti-inflammatory foods are generally just real foods, healthy foods. Um, so, for example, foods that are rich in omega-3 because omega-3 fatty acids help to modulate the inflammatory process. So think of grass-fed beef as a food that's rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Think of cold water fish, sardines, mackerel, tuna, salmon, um, great sources of fatty omega-3 um, uh, omega three fat in the diet, which again, very, very important if you're trying to regulate inflammation and normalize inflammation. If your omega-3 levels are low, and just so you know, I've been testing omega, omega-3 levels in patients for the past decade, and almost every new patient that comes to see me has low, extremely low omega-3 fatty acid levels. So if your omega-3, think of what happens when your omega-3 fatty acid levels are low. One of the things they do, omega-3 fats, is they naturally thin your blood. So when you're low in omega-3 fats, your blood viscosity is thicker. It's like your blood is, is sludge. It's thick. It's sluggish. It doesn't circulate through your bloodstream as well. Your heart has to pump harder to get nutrients and oxygen to your tissues. So basically, it's almost like a, a semi-state of stagnant blood flow, and that can create a lot of problems. So um, making sure you have adequate omega-3 levels is very, very important for, again, not only for tissue nutrition, so getting the blood flow and the oxygen and the nutrients to your tissues, but very, very important to regulate inflammation. That's the other thing that omega-3s do is they actually modulate uh, different types of inflammatory chemicals like cytokines and leukotrienes. So, that, so very, very important that you have adequate quantities of omega-3 fats as an anti-inflammatory food. Now, the other infl anti-inflammatory foods, is there, there are plenty of other ones. I like pineapple. Pineapple contains, and pineapple and mango both actually contain an enzyme called bromelain, which actually serves, there, there are supplemental bromelains that people take all the time, but these these enzymes are actually very, very helpful as an anti-inflammatory. As a matter of fact, there are a number of different products on the market that have plant-based enzymes in them. One, one in particular is, is one of my own design called Matrozyme, which again, it's, it's, it's an anti-inflammatory enzyme product that, that helps to ameliorate inflammation in the bloodstream. So eating foods that are rich in enzymes can be a good way to get uh, an anti-inflammatory effect as well. Other really good solid anti-inflammatory foods, turmeric. Many of you have heard of turmeric. The active ingredient in turmeric is curcumin or curcuminoids. And so you want, if you're buying a supplement, uh, you know, I would look towards something that at the very minimal has uh, has a 90 to 95% curcuminoid concentrated content. Otherwise, you're not really getting a, a meaningful therapeutic dose to help with inflammation. So. The other thing you can do is just use raw turmeric. It's a root. You can grate it into food, soups, and other things. If you take bone broth, you can grate it into bone broth. It's great for uh, combating inflammation. Other really, really great anti-inflammatory foods. Ginger is a great anti-inflammatory food. One of uh, one of my favorite favorite uh, in terms of, of of cooking with it because it it brings a great flavor to a lot of different recipes. So using ginger aggressively can be very, very helpful. Now, some people, some of you that are struggling with FODMAP problems, maybe if you've got SIBO, like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, so if you're struggling with FODMAP issues uh, or FODMAP-based foods, then ginger or turmeric might sometimes upset your stomach and cause you gas and bloating. So if that's if that's the case for you, obviously you don't want to go or, not, or gravitate toward those. Other types of inflammatory foods, um, one of the best is anything with vitamin C. Um, one of the and one of the best with vitamin C is ch the cherry cherries especially tart cherries, uh, very, very rich in vitamin C, but also rich in other compounds that help to battle pain and inflammation. As a matter of fact, many people take cherry concentrate as a supplement to battle pain and inflammation because it's, it's that it can be that effective. But uh, it's always best to eat the whole food 
versus versus the supplement. So if you you know when it's in season, make sure you're getting adequate quantities of uh, of these types of foods. Let's talk a little bit about uh, inflammatory foods. So, or I shouldn't even really call them foods because real food technically is not going to be super inflammatory. I mean, all food by default, as you're digesting it. Um, is going to put stress and pressure on your body and your GI tract. And you remember that the act of eating is an act of warfare. It's your gut versus the food. And, uh, and so the job of your gut is to extrapolate the good from your food and expel the waste because the waste can be toxic and dangerous. That's why we have a gut, a gut that quarantines the bad from the good. So uh, in a sense, if you've got a leaky gut, some foods that are good for you can actually be inflammatory. But I'm not talking about not eating. Um, We've talked about the benefits of fasting and intermittent fasting before, and you can go back and watch those prior episodes if you want to dive into that a little bit more. But I'm specifically talking about the common sense, the don't eat these types of foods, because these are really, really big factors in creating in creating an overabundance of inflammation and chronic problems. The first one um, you probably have all guessed is, is sugar. Now, um, processed sugar is one of the worst things you can put in your body not only is it a carcinogen, but processed sugar uh, stimulates the centers in your brain that can create an addiction. Processed sugar can incite inflammation. Processed sugar can cause vitamin and mineral deficiencies, particularly magnesium deficiency and B vitamin deficiencies and zinc deficiencies. So you, you definitely want to keep sugar out. I mean, you want to keep processed sugar out. And a lot of people say, well, no kidding, Dr. Osborne, I'm not going to eat processed sugar, but then they go and eat it. I mean, we just had Halloween, perfect example of a holiday that that um, socially makes it okay to celebrate by pounding down massive quantities of processed sugar. So check yourself on that. I mean, um, some people are going to eat sugar sometimes, and I'm not here to judge you for that. But you know, if you're struggling and you want to be healthy, you've really got to work hard at eliminating the processed sugars, or you're going to continue to struggle. Uh, there are f- very few guarantees in, in in medicine, but that is one. If you continue to eat sugar and you're trying to get healthy, it will not happen. Um, so. Avoiding processed sugar because it's probably the most damning and inflammatory of all foods that you could eat. Now, those of you who know me know that what my next response is going to be, and that is grain. Grain is a highly, highly inflammatory food. And I'm going to get into um, into a little bit of this next week. We're going to talk about why in great, great detail. Um, a lot of people say, yeah, grain because of gluten. And you're absolutely right. Gluten can be very inflammatory, especially to those who have gluten sensitivity issues. But um, grain has other characteristics and other components that make it an ideal food if you want to have disease. So uh, and and, and just to kind of go through a couple of those, grains are high, generally tend to be very high in omega-6 fatty acids and very, very low in omega-3 fatty acids. So they imbalance your omega-3 to 6 fatty acid ratio, which enhances inflammation. One of the other characteristics about grain, processed grain especially, is that it's very, very low and lacking in vitamins and minerals. So it actually, it's like eating a food and your body has to process that food. But in order to process it, you need vitamins and minerals to process it. So, but the food doesn't contain enough vitamins and minerals to process it. So it's like eating an anti nutritive food that leaves your body raped of nutrients. And in that process con- contributes to a number of different inflammatory cascades. So uh, grain, just by the nature of its low nutrient density, very, very unhealthy and very inflammatory. Uh, another element in grain that's common today, particularly, is the pesticide quantities uh, that are found in most of your grains. They're heavy, 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 heavy loaded with pesticide. They spray the seeds before they plant them in pesticide. They spray the field and then they spray uh, before harvest. So most grains get triple doused in pesticides before they're put into your bread or put into your into your products that your cereal products, et cetera, that you're eating. So not a great thing to consume on a regular basis at all. So, so again, an inflammatory food is grain An inflammatory food group is the processed sugars. I'm not talking about fruit, although some people don't do real well with fruit because they have either um, a digestive disruptive problem, meaning they don't, they don't have uh, their guts inflamed and they have a lot of damage to the brush border where some of the enzymes are produced that help to break fruit down. So some people don't tolerate fruit for that reason. Some people don't tolerate fruit sugars because they're so nutritionally devoid that they have a hard time digesting and processing fructose. Fructose is the type of sugar found in in fruits. And, uh, and, And for example, a copper deficiency will cause you to have an inability to break fructose down. And that can create all kinds of symptoms and side effects, including blood sugar fluctuations and headaches and um, 
brain fog, among other things. So keep in mind that it, when I talk about sugar, I'm not really, really talking about uh, fruit sugar, but many of you might have a problem with fruit because of a, an other underlying issue or problem, not because fruit is necessarily bad for you. Now, on the other side, a lot of people eat too much fruit. So, so, so part of fruit is, is it's not, again, it's not unhealthy to eat fruit, but it's unhealthy to eat pounds of fruit every day as the main staple in your diet, uh, if, especially if you're prone to diabetes or prone to blood sugar problems. So um, just a point of clarification there. Other inflammatory foods, one, this one's not even a food and that's hydrogenated fats. Hydrogenated fats aren't food. They're, they're actually, um, what happens is, is generally speaking, companies will take corn or soy oil and they will force hydrogen into those oils using a heavy metal catalyst. So they'll heat it up with a heavy metal catalyst. And that, that's what creates Crisco. That's what creates the, the, um, the hydrogenated oils. Now, remember, a, an oil at, at room temperature, if it's unsaturated, should be liquid. If it's saturated, it should be solid. A hydrogenated oil is a saturated oil, but it's an artificially saturated oil. And the reason I even make the distinction is because many of you have heard that saturated fat is bad for you, which is not true. Hydrogenated oil is bad for you. And, and keep in mind, hydrogenated oil is saturated, but not all fats that are saturated are hydrogenated. So again, it can get kind of confusing. You just wanna remember that if you see the terms on a food label, hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated, you want to throw the package down and run the opposite direction because it's going to do wonders at creating inflammation in your body. So avoiding those big three categories, very, very important if you're trying to make a recovery from chronic pain and inflammation. Now I want to talk about another strategy um, that it, it's a critical strategy. It's kind of like exercise. Everybody knows that you should do it. Everybody knows that it's important, but um, not everyone pays it enough attention. And, uh, and that's your sleep patterns. Now, some of you might say, well, yeah, but my sleep patterns are off because I can't sleep. Um, and that's another matter. But, but many people go to bed too late. They go to bed chronically at midnight or one in the morning. Um, they wake up too early. They don't get adequate quantities of sleep. And what that does is it sets off a pattern, a change, a hormonal pattern change where it starts to disrupt and affect cortisol. Now, cortisol is your number one natural defense against inflammation, meaning it's the hormone that your adrenal gland, glands secrete to help your body fight pain and inflammation. That's one of its primary jobs. It's, it's like the fire extinguisher. And so if you have minimal sleep or you're not sleeping during the right times, um, what can happen is your cortisol levels can start to become depleted. And when that happens, you're more susceptible to pain and inflammation. So maintaining adequate sleep becomes very, very critical. What's the key time for sleep? Between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., you should be asleep, period. That's when your body resets cortisol. That's when your body, uh, the, the, the diurnal patterns and the circadian rhythms of your body's hormones are actually re-regulated. So if you're not sleeping between the hours of 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., and that doesn't mean go to bed at 10 and wake up at 2, that means be asleep between 10 and 2 and preferably longer on both sides of that. So, you know, if you got in bed at 9 and fell asleep at 930 and then don't obviously don't wake up at 2 a.m. Sleep, you know, sleep, most people will sleep at least until 5 or 6 in the morning. But plan for try to plan for a good eight hours of sleep, especially if you're exercising aggressively because your body needs sleep to heal and repair and, and get the rest to regulate that, that cortisol pattern so that you can stay healthy. Uh, because when your cortisol levels, when you when you're not getting enough sleep, for a lot of people, what initially happens is cortisol goes up. It goes way up, um, and it'll do that for a time until um, what eventually will happen is then your cortisol patterns will start to drop. It's kind of like diabetes. Initially, your insulin goes up to deal with the excessive blood sugar, and then over time, it starts to drop. Same thing, same kind of pattern happens with uh, adrenal fatigue type syndromes. Is initially your cortisol can go up to try to accommodate for your for your bad choice of not sleeping. And over time, you'll hit that fatigue point and your cortisol levels will drop. And that's when the chronic pain and inflammation comes in. But one of the problems, too, of excessive cortisol released by your body when you're treating it wrong is remember that cortisol, too much cortisol actually inhibits calcium absorption. It inhibits vitamin D. Um, it, inhibits, it inhibits magnesium. And that's one of the reasons why chronic steroid use is linked to bone loss. So you got to keep in mind that, that sleep becomes important for more reasons than just inflammation. But if we're just talking about the cortisol and the vitamin D connection, remember that vitamin D is one of the most potent steroids that your body produces to help you battle autoimmune disease, leaky gut, chronic inflammation, blood sugar levels. 
So vitamin D is very, very critical and, and having excessive cortisol or having, a, uh, uh, having excessive inflammation can actually start interfering with that vitamin D and lead to all those other types of problems. So getting that sleep becomes very, very critical, becomes very, very important. So don't underestimate the power of a good night's sleep uh, because it, it, it can make the difference. And I have seen patients who argued with me until their faces were blue. I had one time I had uh, a young man, he was like, I'm a night person, that's just who I am. But he was really, really struggling and he was struggling with some mental problems. And, uh, and, and he, we, you know, he, he couldn't get past that. And I just point blank to him. I said, look, I'm not going to help you anymore until you go home and decide that you're going to go to sleep at a normal hour. Uh, we're done here. And he took it to heart finally and he went home and he, and he, and it took him several weeks, but he finally started sleeping at normal hours. And what happened was nothing short of miraculous. Actually, I knew it would happen, but, um, his, his, uh, his hormone patterns started to regulate and his mood, his, his, his very somber mood and his depression and all those things that were, that were going on with him started to improve and he made a full turnaround and he had done everything else right. His diet was dialed in. He was exercising. He was getting adequate sunshine. His, his, um, his, uh, his water and his air were both being filtered properly. So, and he had good control over stress. He just had horrible control over sleep management because he was a young guy and he was out and he wanted to be out late, late at night. And, and again, until he reined that in, he was not able to make a recovery. So don't underestimate the power of sleep as an important piece to recovering from chronic pain and inflammation. So many people oftentimes do, they just say, Oh, you know, it's not that big of a deal. That can't be the thing that's going to hold me back. And yes, it can. Let me emphasize that it can absolutely hold you back. So don't let it sleep becoming very, very, very critical. Now, so, so we've talked about some strategies today. Um, primarily, we talked to first about movement. Then we talked about um, inflammatory foods, what to avoid, and, and non -ant and anti-inflammatory foods, what foods that you could incorporate more of into your diet. Um, and then we talked a little bit about um, about circadian rhythms and about sleep patterns and how important those were. So the fifth thing, uh, if you've done all those things, let's say you're doing all those things and you're following uh, you're following everything to the T you might consider some strategies that, uh, that again, that, that a lot of people don't realize can contribute to chronic pain and inflammation. There are different triggers and you may, you may have uh, an underlying trigger. One of them is chronic food allergies. If you, if you have chronic food allergies and you haven't identified them or you're getting something that's creating a chronic inflammation that can lead to pain, um, that, that in and of itself can, can hold you back. So if you're doing all those other things right, uh, but you're still having chronic pain, you've, you know, you've got to consider it now. Um, there's allergies, but then there's also what we would consider to be kind of intolerances, and both of them can cause pain. So just think of, of it like this. An allergy is an immune response to a food where your body actually mounts an immune response and creates an inflammatory reaction against the food, uh, whereas an intolerance is when you eat it, your body doesn't have the capacity to properly digest it, and the side effect of that can lead to leaky gut, chronic pain, and inflammation. So uh, an example of that might be like a lactose intolerance. It's an intolerance or an oxalate intolerance. A lot of people can't eat or can't handle high levels of oxalates because they're missing certain kinds of bacteria in their GI tract that help to process and break oxalate down. These bacteria are called oxalobacter. Uh, and so if you don't have adequate oxalobacter in your GI tract, you might not respond very well to a high oxalate diet. Remember, some of your healthiest vegetables like spinach are high in oxalates and they're good for you. But again, if you have an abnormal microbiome, you might not be able to tolerate those types of foods. So there are food allergies and there are food intolerances to consider. And so you might not have thought about that as being a cause of your pain and inflammation and you should. So if you haven't consider those things and if you, and if, um, if you don't know how to consider those things, work with a good functional medicine practitioner who, who understands those concepts really well and can help you identify them. So that's one strategy of food as a trigger. Uh, another trigger very, very common for chronic pain is heavy metal exposure. And I see what I've seen in a number of cases, chronic mercury, cadmium, and lead being probably the three most common that I see in practice where people have exposure to those on a consistent enough basis and a high enough level where they're creating an inflammatory reaction against the heavy metal that's leading to a chronic pain response. So, you know, again, consider looking at and consider heavy metals, especially if you're 50 plus in age because you grew up in an age where there was lead in the gasoline, there was lead in the paint, there was lead in children's toys, you know, before it was it was systematically removed in the U.S. So 
you know, the 50 and up, that's called, we call those people who grew up at, at that time, the lead age, right? And they have a higher propensity toward, you know, lead bioaccumulation in their tissues. Um, and, and especially, uh, you know, think of it, consider too, with mercury, you got to consider as vaccines. A lot of your vaccines do contain mercury. So if, if after getting a vaccination that you started to experience chronic pain and inflammation, you definitely want to consider that mercury in the vaccine could be one of the potential triggers. Aside from the vaccine itself, the mercury, the adjuvant in the vaccine could possibly be a trigger. So, you know, it might be something that you do to have a test run to identify by accumulation of mercury in your tissues, creating chronic pain and inflammation. Okay, so we've got food as a trigger. We've got, you know, heavy metals can be a trigger. Another big trigger for chronic pain and inflammation is infection. And there are a number of different kinds of infection. There's bacteria, there's viruses, there's parasitic infections, there's yeast overgrowth. Super common is yeast overgrowth. What we see like a candida um, uh, as a yeast overgrowth or a ge geotrichum as a ye yeast overgrowth. There are a number of different species of yeast. Um, that can contribute to chronic pain. And there's, you know, I will make a differentiation. There's yeast internally, meaning you can have a yeast overgrowth inside of your gut that creates a leaky gut and that subsets the stage for molecular mimicry leading to chronic pain. If you don't know what molecular mimicry is, go back to one of the other episodes where I was talking about gut function uh, because I defined molecular mimicry in detail. I don't have time to go through it again today, but um, yeast can do that if you have, a, a, have an intestinal yeast overgrowth. Uh, yeast in your intestines can also produce or overproduce alcohol when you eat carbohydrates. So you might have a carbohydrate problem uh, when you have a yeast overgrowth because yeast convert carbs into alcohol in about five hours. Um, and that that that's a very, very well-documented phenomenon that can occur. If you have a big enough yeast overgrowth, you can actually develop something called auto brewery syndrome. So basically your gut becomes a distillery and you're walking around with liver damage and brain fog and poor memory because you're slowly drinking alcohol even though you're not actually drinking alcohol. So um, yeast overgrowth is a super common one that can cause pain and inflammation. You can have yeast ex actually inside of you, but you can also have yeast outside of you. And so some people have chronic mold exposure in their homes. And uh, again, remember yeast and mold are the same thing. Uh, so if you've got a mold, uh, a moldy basement or mold in your air ducts and you're living in that house and you're struggling and you feel better when you go out of your house, you know, that's just kind of a clue or an insight as to, hey, Maybe I need to. I mean, maybe I need to have my home investigated for chronic mold behind the walls or whatever it might be. Or, um, but consider mold on the outside as a potential trigger, just like you might consider a yeast infection on the inside as a potential trigger. So those are some other things that you can look for in terms of chronic pain and inflammation. Um, and uh, let's get to some of your questions now. So. Let's see here. I don't know how to pronounce this name properly. Dunyal, or if I said your name wrong, I apologize, but Dunyal Roan. I'm just tuning in from St. Louis. Good old St. Louis. How you doing? I have inflammation in my hip. Yes, exercise does hurt, and that makes me stop exercising. I hear pomegranate juice is good as well. Is that true? Yeah, pomegranate juice um, can be very, it's a very, very effective, but I, I would I would say less pomegranate juice and more pomegranate. So eat the, eat the whole food as opposed to the juice with the high quantities of sugar. But what I would recommend too is get in a pool, do exercise work in the pool and really, really effectively um, maybe maybe even consider some yoga uh, and consider having somebody look at that hip from a physical perspective because sometimes pain, one of the things that we talked about movement, but we didn't talk about flexibility. And flexibility meaning, you know, how tight is your hip? How tight are your hip flexors? Because a lot of hip pain comes from tight hip flexors because people sit all day long in that L position and their hip flexors just cinch up on them. And so when they get up to go walk around, their hip flexors are compressing their, 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 um, their head of their femur and their acetabulum. And that is creating friction and creating additional pain and inflammation. So yoga maneuvers, stretching and flexibility can also be a really, really important part of this. Again, what I said before, when I used to run rehab clinics, that was pretty much what I would do with patients at the very beginning is I would have them go through basic movement patterns and stretching uh, and, you know, 90 plus percent would respond really, really well and heal. Uh, let's see here. Prioshka, hi, doctor. After taking betaine hydrochloride, my joint pain reduced. And here's one of the reasons why that can happen. Some people with low stomach acid, um, what's happening is when they're eating certain bacteria, because you don't have adequate stomach acid, can get down into the GI tract and populate the GI tract. And some of these bacteria can produce endotoxins that look like your cartilage and your joints setting the stage for an inflammatory reaction in your joints. 
So um, taking that, that acid can reduce the ability for those bacteria to populate your, your um, intestine, uh, your, your small intestine and your large intestine. And so reduces that leaky gut endotoxin release into your bloodstream, getting to your joints, creating a problem. But one of the other reasons why you might have experienced that is that betaine hydrochloride helps you to digest protein. And so if you're eating meats, it helps you break down the amino acids from your food. And sometimes people have joint pain because they have amino acid deficiency or they have protein deficiency. So a couple of different reasons why that could be happening for you, Priyushka. I'm just glad it's, it's working. Uh, let's see here. Tawana's chiming in. Thanks for all the good information. You're welcome, Tawana. Glad that you're finding it helpful. Uh, let's see here. And I've been taking prednisone daily 20 years. Oh, gosh. Um, but still have inflammation issues like osteoarthritis. What can I do to help with pain? I am also gluten-free. And um, have you read, I mean, you can answer in, but have you read No Grain, No Pain? That That's the, really, that's honestly, that's the first step that you need to do is you need to implement chapter seven and eight immediately. Going gluten-free is not enough. Um, there, there are so many other strategies that have to be implemented with chronic pain. And if you're not implementing them, uh, it's not going to be enough. And if you've been, I don't know what the dose of prednisone that you've been taking is, but if you've been taking it for 20 years, my gosh, shame on that doctor for allowing you to do that. Um, long-term, and you know, again, talk to your doctor about it, but long-term prednisone use doubles the risk of bone loss. So, and there is no safe low dose quantity of prednisone that does not affect bone health. So, you know, you really should go back and talk to your doctor about why he's needing you to stay on that prednisone indefinitely because you know aside from the fact that prednisone causes bone loss it can actually induce autoimmune disease aside from that it can cause calcium magnesium and vitamin d problems and if and of course vitamin d deficiency can cause autoimmune pain it's actually directly linked to rheumatoid arthritis um so again i, I would i would have a completely new conversation with whatever doctor it is that you're seeing um and have maybe a, a talk about re-strategizing the plan because if you've been on it for 20 years and you're still having pain it's obviously not doing its job it's not doing the job that it's intended to do and you need to change strategies um if you're oh gosh up to 20 milligrams that's a super high dose that's a super high dose it's a dose that oftentimes we're worried about inducing kidney damage and inducing actually autoimmune problems in the kidney now i don't say all those things to scare you so don't run to your other doctor and yell at them just Go to them and have a good conversation about how you can re-strategize because it's, if it's not working, it, it you know, ob it's obviously not working and you need a new plan. But you can follow the no grain, no pain plan in chapter seven and eight, and that might get you moving very quickly in the right directions so that you can taper the prednisone because you won't, would never want to quit it cold turkey. Again, you want to work with your doctor to taper that. But you've got to start with the right diet and lifestyle first. So that's the best thing I can have you do that you can see right behind me here. No Grain, No Pain. You can buy it at Barnes & Noble. You can pick it up on Amazon. You can also go to nograinnopainbook.com if you want to pick up a free leaky gut manual. We'll give that to you for free when you get your copy of the book. But start following that right away. Uh, Saba is chiming in. I have rheumatoid arthritis. Any tips to help with pain? Well, hopefully you were listening to what I just told Ann because uh, my original training was, was actually in the VA hospital when I did a stent in the rheumatology department. One of the reasons why... I had to get out of that hospital was because nobody ever got better with the traditional methodologies of treatment. And if you're not, if you're not part of my Facebook group, uh, make sure you join it. I actually just got back from Harvard a couple months ago where I gave a presentation and talked about rheumatoid arthritis and the tragedy and travesty that is the medical care revolving around it. So um, you can listen to that speech if you want to just go to Dr. Peter Osborne um, on Facebook and there's a and that video is posted up there and you can find it, and listen to it. But get you a copy of No Grain, No Pain and uh, and get going on Chapter seven and eight as soon as possible. Uh, and 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 is chiming in again. I have MS fibro and I've tried to stop but can't. Um, yeah, you've that and it's just going to take a strategy. You're just going to have to work with a with a qualified doctor and, and have a strategy around around working that in the right direction, because. Uh, if you've got MS2, multiple sclerosis, the, the likelihood that you have a severe vitamin D deficiency is very high, especially if you've been taking prednisone that long because it causes vitamin D deficiency. And, and by creating, and it, there's a me molecular mechanism where it prevents you from absorbing vitamin D, uh, but there's another molecular, me molecular 
mechanism where it prevents um, a genetic receptor for vitamin D uptake um, in that in that. So if you're again, you've been on it that long, that vitamin D deficiency uh, actually can cause what's what's known as pseudo MS or, or um, multiple sclerosis. It's not not a true multiple sclerosis, but but all the symptoms of multiple sclerosis exist. You might also have them measure your vitamin B12 levels because B12 deficiency can cause demyelinization and that can lead to the symptoms of MS as well. So hopefully those are those are helpful tips for you, but I, I get out there and get, get those things taken care of right away. Stacy, I have the trifecta of pain and inflammation with IC. I, those of you who don't know how IC is interstitial cystitis. Uh, I'm gonna assume that's right, Stacia. You can tell me if it isn't, but uh, I'm gonna assume that's what you mean. Uh, pelvic floor dysfunction and endo, and I'm gonna assume there you mean endometriosis. Currently, they are treating it with Cymbalta, Gabapentin, and physical therapy. I love physical therapy. I think it's great for pelvic floor dysfunction. However, Cymbalta and Gabapentin are not going to fix your problem. They're only going to mask your problem. And Gabapentin, the problem with Cymbalta and Gabapentin both is that they affect the GI tract. So you're going to get horrendous, horrendous gastrointestinal side effects. Go back, Stacia, and watch. It was about two months ago um, on an episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain, and you can watch our archives. Uh, if you go to the glutenfreesociety.org blog, you can watch our archives there. But I talked in detail about drugs that cause gut dysfunction. So medications that cause gut dysfunction. And let me see, I might even have a picture here. Um, here it is. I'm going to very good. I'm going to punch that up for you. You can see that picture. Guts or guts. Drugs that cause gut dysfunction. And so problem with using Cymbalta and Gabapentin long term to manage pain is that they wreck your gut. And then you're you're now you're struggling with other issues to get adequate nutrition. And so then you you have you struggle with healing. And remember, nutrition is first and foremost extremely critical in the healing process. So if you're if you're taking medications that are impacting the way that your gut can process nutrients from your food, you're going to have a really hard time ever healing. So remember this, I see interstitial cystitis is a form of autoimmune disease. Now endometriosis is being linked to autoimmunity. So there are four common triggers for autoimmune disease that you really want to have your, your docs um, test you for, and, you know, working with those docs. And so you, you want to have them test for vitamin and mineral deficiencies. You want to have them test for infections. You want to have them test for, gluten sensitivity and other food problems. And you want to have them test for chemical sensitivities that you might have, including the medications. I have seen patients sometimes come in and they're allergic to the drugs that they've been prescribed. So, um, and that's what creates a long-term addiction problem or a long-term problem where the drug, yes, it reduces their symptoms, but it perpetuates their inflammation because they're actually having an allergic response to the drug. So the drug's doing two things. It's helping their symptoms, but it's creating inflammation. And so it's this vicious cycle. So you really got to get with somebody who's willing to help you try to manage this a little bit better. Again, I would recommend that you read No Grain, No Pain and start following chapter seven and eight. I've seen a number of people with this trifecta of problems do really, really well on the No Grain, No Pain diet protocol. Uh, Anne's chiming back in on, and let me get this picture out of the way here. Anne's chiming back in on uh, taking 5,000 vitamin, 5,000 units. I'm going to assume you mean IU, international units of vitamin D and, and not milligrams. Um, sometimes that's not enough, Ann. Um, to have your doctors check your 25, I'm going to type that in for you, OHD levels. Your 25 OHD levels should be checked. And if they're below 50, you're not taking enough vitamin D. Um, you really and ideally want to get it up over 70. Between 70 and 100 um, is ideal. And so, again, just ask your doctor to check your vitamin D level. And if it's not there, you might have to go up. Sometimes people have to go up to 7,000, 8,000, even up to 10,000 units of vitamin D on a daily basis to get enough. Now, the caveat to that is if you have kidney disease, don't take high levels of vitamin D supplementation because it can cause your calcium levels to go up too dramatically. Um, but um, but anyway, if you again, if you've got kidney disease, you just make sure that you're monitoring your serum calcium level if you're taking vitamin D or have your doctor monitor it. Uh, let's see here. Darren, Nikki, Walker, bon Bonner. That's a long name. How you doing, Darren? Uh, or is it two people, Darren and Nikki? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but hello. Um, she's just saying, and I have both MS and fibromyalgia. Vitamin D is amazing. So she's just sharing her experience with vitamin D. Thanks for sharing, uh, sharing that experience. 
Um, and if possible, start working with a good functional doctor, ideally Dr. Osmond. Thanks for the, for the plug, Matthew. I appreciate it. Um, it will change your life. I agree. It will change your life. Working uh, with functional medicine changes lives. Uh, Kayla, good afternoon to you as well. Nice to see you on. Let's see here. Natalie. Hi, Dr. Osborne. Any tips for strengthening the lower esophageal sphincter? Reflux continues despite very healthy diet, regular exercise, low stress, and good sleep. Yeah, go see a chiropractor and see what they can do in terms of adjustments. Um, you know, sometimes there's a physical problem in the sphincter, and, and having a physical solution is sometimes necessary. So I would get with a, get with a good chiropractor who's got a good reputation in that. And, uh, and see how well they might be able to help you out. Good questions. Ann Holt, do I see patients? Yes, I do. Um, you can go to drpeterosborne.com and there's a button at the top that says Origins Healthcare. You just click that button and that'll take you to get information about our clinic. Um, let's see here. I don't know what name this is, SSCFNXL, but hello back to you. Thanks for joining in. Oh, and Darren Nikki Walker Bonner is Nikki. So Nikki, nice to have you on. Uh, Andrea is chiming in. Hi, Andrea, how you doing? Yeah, if you guys are just coming in and coming on, let me know where you're from and show me some love. Let me, uh, if you're enjoying the information, hit the love button, hit the like button. Uh, let me know that that you're getting, um, you know, that you're getting value out of this conversation today. It, it, uh, I'd love to see your positive feedback. And if you're not getting value, hit the frowny face. Um, no, nobody better be hitting the frowny face because this is all solid value. All right. So let's see. Do we have any other questions before it is time? Because we're right at the hour. Um, Liz from Brooklyn, New York is, uh, is chiming in. Hi, Liz. Thanks for joining us today. So it looks like let me just scroll back through, make sure I didn't miss any of your questions today. Uh, it looks like we got them all. Uh, Joyce is asking, where is my office? It's in Sugarland, Texas. So it's just outside of Houston, Texas. Um, looks like that is the last question I've got time for. Look, we're, um, we're going to be doing a time change on uh, the Pick Dr. Osmore's Brain Show. Um, Fridays at 1.30, we've been on for, you know, the past four months uh, running the show. But uh, we're going to be moving into Monday evenings. So um, mark your calendar and mark your schedule for Monday evening at 6 p.m. And that's a central time, 6 p.m. central time. We're moving the show to that time because many of you have emailed us saying, hey, Dr. Osborne, I just can't make it at 1.30 on Friday, uh, the weekend or work. So I want to move it to a time where more of you can tune in and get this valuable information. So mark your calendars. Monday evening, we'll be starting this Monday. So we're going to be doing almost like a back-to-back. -back. So just a couple more days till your next dose of Dr. Osborne's brain. And um, and we'll see you on Monday. So last thing here, what do I think about the keto diet? Deborah is asking, what do I think about the keto diet? Tune in uh, to a couple of episodes ago where I talked all about it, Deborah. Make sure you, you go back to our archive and, and watch those shows. And to do that, again, uh, you can go to glutenfreesociety.org, O-R-G, and it's in the blog roll. So glutenfreesociety.org. Make sure you go check us out. Make sure you subscribe to our newsletter. We get, we get valuable coupons for some of the best grain-free supplements in the world. Uh, and we have fantastic information coming out on a, on a twice a week basis for you to ensure that you can maximize your health. And uh, let's see here. Wow, Priyashka, you're a, you're a true warrior. Um, it's 1230 a.m. in India and you've stayed awake for my live video. I'm honored that you would stay awake, but I want you to go to sleep. So <laughs> um, I'd rather see you get your 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. sleep time, then tune in, I, although I do appreciate and, and am honored that you would stay up, but I want you to be healthy, so maybe this switch to six is going to be a better switch for you, um, because you, at least you'll be you'll be uh, on the other side of that. Okay. Uh, last question, and then I really do have to go. Donna, I got to get this one answered. You talked about inflammatory foods like gluten along with sugar, allergenic foods, etc. Do they all affect us the same? Does just a tiny bit of an allergen or, or sugar give you the same response? 
as that tiny bit of gluten. Um, I wouldn't say, I mean, with gluten, it's been studied. We know that, you know, one breadcrumb can cause an inflammatory response for, you know, for a couple of months. Nobody's really sh studied how long the, the sugar can create an inflammatory response. So I, I honestly, you know, you've stumped me. I just really can't answer that question intelligently with it without making something up, which I refuse to do. So it's a great question. I would just say, don't, don't eat the things that you know to create inflammation. And if you do, uh, do it on a very rare basis and, and, uh, and get back to, to healthy eating as quickly as you possibly can. All right, folks, have a great weekend. We will see you next week for Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Take care.